Artists pursue their craft, no doubt, for many and varied reasons. And while some are rewarded with fame and fortune, most struggle to have the space and time to make the kind of work they want to share with the public. The inaugural Johanna Metcalf Award is a generous prize, $25,000, given just last night to five Ontario-based performing artists. It will give them, and another artist of their choosing, more opportunity to create. With us now for more, in alphabetical order, playwright and theater creator, Sonny Drake. Composer and classical pianist, Alice Pingyi Ho. Composer, James Rolfe. Multidisciplinary artist, Santi Smith. And world music performer and composer, Miriam Tolar. Uh, congratulations to all of you, first of all. You're all $25,000 richer today, so well done. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, you have been justly rewarded for doing what you all do so well, which is to create art that makes all of us happier. Let's just go through, I think one by one, um, your stories, and you can tell us a little bit more about what you do. Miriam, start us off. Well, um, I'm a singer and a composer, and um, I've been singing all my life, ever since I can remember. And uh, I struggled to get to a point where I was a professional performer because even though I did it all through my school life, I'm, I was raised in a m more conservative Muslim upbringing. And so I just assumed I wouldn't be allowed to be a professional performer as a career. But then I finished university and I still only wanted to sing. And I finally had the courage to come out to my parents. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> and, yeah. Where are you from originally? From Egypt. Egypt originally? And yes. university was where? University of Toronto. And I, I majored in French. <laughs> en français. Oui. And uh, you speak Arabic as well, I think, Yes, don't I you? do. Yes. Yeah. English, Arabic, and French. That's right. OK, well done. Uh, Sunny, tell us about you. Yeah, well, I, so I'm a playwright and theatre creator. Um, I started making work just by making work. I didn't go to theatre school. At the time, um, well, I'm transgender, and at the time, I didn't see a place for myself in, in theatre school. So I just started making work and making work. I put on my earlier shows in living rooms, backyards, basements, underground warehouses. Um, and at one point, called up every theatre in town and begged them, would you let me put on a show in, in your theatre? And slowly over the years, um, started performing in, in uh, different institutions. And um, yeah, here I am today. I'm going to take another guess about you. I'm going to guess you're not originally from Toronto. No, good guess. Um, so I grew up in Brisbane, Australia. No and kidding. Yeah. I moved to Toronto for love nine years ago. Nine years ago. In the middle good. of winter, in January. It was a bit of a shock. And yet you stayed. I stayed, yeah. I love it here. Well yeah. done. Yeah. Alice, tell us about you. Um, I am, um, well, I'm a Canadian Chinese composer. Um, I wrote all kinds of music, um, opera, theater, orchestra, chamber work dance, and I'm also a classically trained pianist, and I'm specialized playing my colleagues' work, contemporary music, and also, um, you know, classical repertoire. And um, so I, my training, I was born in Hong Kong, and um, um, I have very supportive parents. And when I was young, I'm taking piano lesson, ballet lesson, which is very privileged. At that time, uh, Hong Kong was still a British colony, and, and I was one of those lucky kids can go to, you know, take this lesson. And I'm very blessed, that, you know, that bring me who I am right now. And, and I study in the States. And, Alice, and, you're, you're a Hoosier, aren't you? Yeah! You're a Hoosier. <laughs> okay, for those who don't know, you, you went to Indiana University. Yes, I went to Indiana University. Why'd you go there? I got a scholarship ah, um, okay. to study um, um, uh, music. At, at first, I was um, a piano major. And then I was so discouraged because there are so many great students in India, so competitive. And so I started taking a uh, composition lesson, and I fall in love with that. I, I think for me, it's my call. I like to create and you know, in start, in interpreting other people's music. Actually, I create my own. Um, and then I marry a Canadian, <laughs> and so I moved to Toronto. And um, actually, I follow my husband. He is a, he was a professor at University of Toronto, and Great. I raised a family here. Great. How many kids? I have two beautiful daughters. <laughs> Congratulations. That's Thank lovely. Santi, mm -hmm. tell us your story. Santi Smith, Dagalun Yakua, Nyung Nyats, Gongwehoi, Ganyangahaga, Six Nations. 
I'm from Six Nations. I'm the artistic director of Gahawi Dance Theatre. What language were you just speaking? Gayangahaga, which is also known as Mohawk. So it's one of the Haudenosaunee languages. I'm Mohawk, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, Gahawi means to carry in Mohawk. So that's what I do with my work is carry forward its stories, carry for, forward our culture. That's the name of your company, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And um, so I started, my love has always, in my go-to form, has always been dance. That's the way that I um, love uh, to express myself primarily. But I also do other things like um, design work. I come from a family of artists. Uh, my formal training is at the National Ballet School. I stayed there for six years and then only became a chor uh, choreographer when I had stopped dance and thought that I would go into university and went to McMaster University and pursued um, kinesiology and psychology, but it wasn't until I was invited by Gary Farmer, who was an actor from Six Nations, to create a choreography for the National Film Board. And it, it was the first time I was in the studio working and creating dance, listening to Indigenous singers, and being able to tell a narrative that reflected who I was and my Haudenosaunee culture. And then that's when the, um, the whole aha moment happened. And since that point, I was continually building and wanting to do more of that type of expression. Of and, and you have gone all the way as a mm -hmm. McMaster University person. You started as a student, yeah. and now you are? I'm full circle. I'm back as chancellor. You McMaster. are the chancellor. Yes. Yeah. So this year, I have a... I, was installed in November and I did my first convocation and I will be there for a three-year term so I'm happy to be back and it's I love the campus so Do you know how many hands you will shake by the time you are done being <laughs> chancellor how many yeah, <laughs> yeah. the answer is I a know, lot I know I, uh, one of the dean the one of the deans said okay so now that's uh, two done but you have 70 79 more <laughs> convocations to go that's right. that is right <laughs> so that's a lot of hands and if, if you guess about 250 300, 300 400 300. students Per convocation, yeah. do the math. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Thank Good luck. You. James, tell us about you. Sure. I am a composer um, and I write for all kinds of combinations, especially opera, dance, music theater. Uh, I grew up in Ottawa and um, I would never have been a composer except that in grade six, um, a call went out to my parents saying, you know, what instrument might your son like to play? And I said, trombone. <laughs> and they said, no, that's too loud. And so I said, trumpet. And that's Apparently okay, <laughs> pretty loud still. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I never really looked back. I was always sort of attracted to music, first as a performer, but then more often because trumpet players are often counting like 300 bars rest while everyone else plays, I was listening to the, <laughs> the orchestra and the bands around me and thinking, I'd like to create that. And um, here I am, you know, 40 years later, uh, and it's a it's a, a wonderful job. It really, it's like a dream job um, because you get to do these things you never imagined might exist. Uh, and and put them in front of people who then relate to them in a feeling way and kind of it's a kind of a miracle every time. Is there a lesson in your story about the importance of music education in our school system? There sure is. I sure thought so. <laughs> yeah, <about that. laughs> you know it, it's really um, important to get people at a certain age, and that's almost always around 14, 15, 16 or so. And, and if they have a spark of creativity, which almost all of us do, probably all of us do, then you know you have to get them at that age. Whether they don't make a career of it or not is immaterial, but they need to be able to told to need to be told that it's important spiritually and, and soulfully to relate to each other in an artistic feeling way. And I think that's like a, a basic building block of a civil society. Uh, and I think there's a lot of evidence around us right now that we need more of that and not less. Mm. Uh, yeah. The typical question I'm supposed to ask at this point is, at what point did you know that you wanted to be an artist and what was the spark that sort of inspired you to dot, dot, dot? I'm not going to ask that question. Instead, I'm going to ask, Sonny, start us off here. At what point did you fully appreciate the fact that to be an artist for your entire life, pursuing the craft that you wanted to pursue, would probably mean a life of penury? You know, it was probably when, okay, so I was living in San Francisco, really trying to establish my theater practice. And the only place I could afford was literally to live in a washroom. So I put um, a mattress on top of the bathtub. There was a, 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 a bit of wood and then a mattress and I was lying in bed and I accidentally bumped the taps and got a shower <laughs> in bed. And I just thought to myself, you know, this is not the most lucrative profession. <laughs> you don't say. Yeah. 
Huh. <laughs> Miriam, how about you? Well, I married a musician and... Um, Double trouble. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and so um, at first we didn't mind that we didn't have a lot of money, but um, then we had one child, then a second child, then a third child, and touring became... Um, to tour, we lost money because we had to bring all of our kids and the babysitter and um, figure all of that out. And um, so around that time, we realized one of us actually had to get it another job to give us a steady paycheck. Outside of your music Outside work. of music, so that we could continue to do the music that we needed to do. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Santi, how about you? Well, uh, like I said, I come from, I think I'm a third generation artist. So that sort of artist lifestyle is something that I grew up in. And of course, my parents uh, were hoping that I would finish McMaster and go on to uh, become a doctor or <laughs> and sort of break the artist curse. Um, but no, I chose to consciously pursue my artwork. And that was something that um, if, you, if you're driven by something, it's your calling, you can't deny it. Mm -hmm. And trying to deny it is, is also unhealthy. So I pursued my artwork. Um, you do know if you were a doctor focusing on the kinesiology that you also have, you'd be a lot richer. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. right, yeah. So it's a sacrifice. Artists take a lot of sacrifice. Dance artists are one of on the, what, the lowest rung of um, support and finances. But uh, And to be an artist, to be a dance artist, you're also fighting your body. There's lots of challenges, mm -hmm. and you have to do it because you love it. There's no other way. James, how about you? Yeah, uh, I think in my late 20s, there was a week when I was living mostly off white rice fried onions and soy sauce, uh, waiting for a check to come in, which just was taking forever. But you know, it's, it's interesting what Santi just said, because um, you know, we gather around as musicians and artists and sort of complain or compare our, our, our fortunes uh, or lack of fortune. And um, it's always comforting to think there are actually people who are paid less than we are. And if dancers, unfortunately, are paid less. But it always comes down to the lowest rung, poets. Hmm. Like, there's no money in poetry. Now, you were somewhat fortunate uh, in as much as you came from a family that was, I'm talking to oh, you now. Yes, that you, you came, from a, you came from, a, from a fairly well off family in Hong Kong, right? Yes. So you so didn't to necessarily, speak. You, didn't, you, you never had the sleeping in the bathroom overnight uh, situation. Well, it's, um, um, actually, I'm sharing both uh, Santi and Marilyn's story. I, I, uh, when I was a child, I, uh, I studied piano and, and ballet, but my family actually encouraged me to be a doctor because it's a very respectful um, occupation. But luckily, I, I'm not bright enough. I don't have <laughs> good marks to enter the medical school. In fact, I got a scholarship to study music in the States. And consequently, I, I met my husband, and, and then um, I, I came to Canada. Um, and I um, studied at U of T to uh, did my master degree. When I studied at university, no one teach me how to promote myself as a composer. And as soon as I graduate, I realized I have no way to earn a living as a composer because mm. um, not even getting performances. I just started out and, and I don't know where to get grant. And also at that time, I have two young daughters and my, fa my, my husband is on the tenure track. So I, as I'm choosing between um, uh, reality of making a living and also pursuing what I, I love, you know, in creating music. So at one time I worked at CIBC as a bank teller. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and but it, it's, it's very strange. As soon as I get up from work, as soon as the baby go to sleep, at night I just try to, you know, go back to the drawing board and, and you know, um, looking for opportunities, call for score and, and try to get get, you know, uh, my creative juice flowing. Well, you talk about the reality of living as an artist in this country, mm -hmm. and we have here, Sheldon, why don't you bring these graphics up and I will describe them for those listening on podcast. Try to make a living as an artist in Canada, and here's what you're looking at. This is uh, the median individual income of a Canadian artist is $24,300 a year. That's 44% less than all other Canadian workers. And a typical artist has a household income of $57,800 a year, and that is a third lower than all workers if you put them in a general pot. So I know we have this impression, Sonny, we have this impression that artists are all making a killing because, of course, that's what we see on TV or at the movies. 
The reality is pretty different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, and it becomes that sort of that, a difficult challenge between the more you need to supplement your work with other forms of income or work, the less time you have for your creative practice, mm -hmm. and the less time you have for your creative practice, the less you are able to establish yourself and then make a living from your art. Now, I have seen your work, and it is, how shall I put this? It's not mainstream, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it is, I mean, you push, as, you, you push at the edges of what's conventional in the theater. Yep. Uh, you, I presume you know that if you were a little more conventional, you'd make more money. Well, here's the funny thing. Tell us. Is I am convinced that audiences are actually hungry for out-of-the-box work. And my experience touring my work to 59 cities across the world is that people want things that are a little different, that challenge their worldviews, that give them something to think about and talk about and feel. And, uh, and so... I really advocate um, with um, theatres and gatekeepers to take some risks and program work that is really different and actually audiences are, are ready for it. I, I don't dispute that, but James, I'd add to this, people like Phantom of the Opera and Cats as well. Yes, and they I would, seem to. And I would put the same admonition to you, which is yep. your, your music, if you wrote a little more mainstream, mm -hmm. could be more popular. Do you ever think about that? Um, yeah, and, but for like three seconds. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, what's the point if I'm trying to, um, you know, I, I might as well get a job in, uh, as a bank teller uh, as to satisfy someone else's idea of what would be a uh, saleable commercial. Uh, I'd rather just put my own dreams up on stage and if people like them, great. You know, if they don't, fine. Um, I mean, I'm in a luxurious position that I usually have someone else producing and he's, that person worries about whether they can sell the seats or not. And so they're working in opera that's a very conservative uh, medium highly conservative, so anything new at all that's not by some guy who's been dead for 100 years is, is a risky proposition. That being said, this exactly like Sonny says, people do have both in them this appetite for something new um, and something transformative, so you know, every now and then you can make a little breakthrough. Miriam, how do you walk that tightrope between, on the one hand, wanting to be very creative and do something utterly distinctive, and on the other hand, not getting too far outside the comfort zone of an audience? Um, to be honest, I don't actually worry about the audience at all. Interesting. <laughs> um, I just do what I love to do, and it's not, um, it's not something that is from the outside, it's something from inside of me, and I just feel like I just need to sing, and I need to feel really good about what I'm singing, and I need to feel really good about the messages that I'm putting out there, and if I don't, I can't actually do it. I just can't. Um, but it's, it's not that I'm opposed to mainstream things. I love actually Broadway and I love Broadway songs. And I used to do mm -hmm. that all the time when I was in high school, I was in Godspell and I was in West Side Story. Um, but one thing about the music that I do is, um, I was really, um, separate from my background. I tried to avoid it. Um, I wanted to be Canadian and I didn't, I was, I felt like I wasn't accepted um, because of my background. So growing up, I actually stayed away from world music, Arabic music, and, and um, grew up with Joni Mitchell and Prince and um, Kate Bush. And then um, when I was in my 20s, that was when my brother, um, Ahmed Hassan, he was a composer for dance, he's passed away, but he gave me an opportunity to do a piece for dance makers um, where they needed an Arabic singer. And he said, you speak Arabic and you can sing. I'll hire you and you get to tour if, if uh, you take Arabic singing lessons. And that's where my journey into world music began. And that's where I actually found a way into my background that I uh, then loved and found challenging and exciting and interesting. And so, um, I, like I said, I don't think about the audience. It's just, I'm just driven to do this and whatever happens, happens. <laughs> I want to ask you the same thing. How much do you worry about whether or not the audience will like or feel comfortable with what you're doing on stage? Um, I think that uh, for most of my work, um, I'm, I have a, a broad audience. So, for example, I, my recent work, The Mush Hole, which is about um, the Mohawk Institute Residential School, where I worked with survivors, there are um, 
audiences have indigenous folks in the audience. They also have intergenerational survivors in the audience. So there's a different experience. They're also seeing indigenous bodies on the stage. So for me, that's really important to be able to offer that across Canada, around the world, that, um, you know, dance theater is not just um, your Western, that there's other voices that come forward. And that's my responsibility and my goal as an artist, as a producer, to be able to share that. But then it, there's a whole range of, um, you know, different cultures coming in, the general public coming in to see the work, who may be, for the first time, first ever heard about what a residential school is, or others had read about it but didn't know um, the depth of the emotional impacts mm -hmm. that it involved. And so as an artist, then we're able to tell these stories that for me is very story driven, my work, and um, have people respond to them. And um, it's a bit of education as well because of, you know, those stories, a lot of uh, Indigenous stories have not been in the mainstream. So for me, that, that's really important. So I do think about audiences in that way. I don't create work for pleasing audiences. So you it, work to please yourself? Uh, the story. The, the story, story and the right. vision of the word comes first. Mm. How about you? How, how much do you think about whether or not your work is accessible to the audience? Um, first of all, I embrace all kind of music, all genre. I think there's no crime against, you know, m musical or mainstream. I don't think there's any division of, of uh, uh, you know, whether there's a class of music. For myself, I think it's important for me to uh, create something that is satisfying to myself first. Um, I like to attain beauty and have peace when I create the work. At the same time, I like to have the performers get excited um, what I create for them because um, it is very boring if I just write for myself and mm -hmm. and and this is a collaboration to mm -hmm. to be able to learn um, you know what the performers they are capable of and bring out their strong points and their cultures and the third I, I think ultimately I hope my work will send a message to the audience I think the audience are more intelligent than we expected. Mm -hmm. What's the message you want to send? Well, I like to, uh, first of all, challenge their mind, you know, whether they love my work or they don't like it. And, and, and um, you know, what uh, is reflect to their experience where it is, is, is uh, connect to them. And um, uh, recently I have a lot of requests because um, I'm uh, of my Chinese heritage. A lot of my project, they, uh, the organizer like me to write something uh, that using Chinese instruments or based on a Chinese uh, a tale. Mm -hmm. And one very satisfying uh, uh, project that I wrote for the uh, Canadian Children's Opera Company for their 50th anniversary. And this is all children cast, no adult singer. Mm -hmm. And there are three languages besides singing in English. They need to learn Mandarin, Cantonese slang. At first, I thought this is a nightmare. I mean, this is kids, they, maybe 5% they are, they are Chinese and, and the rest, they, they, they all English speak, uh, spoken uh, uh, generation. But surprisingly, um, they are very excited to be educated in a totally different cultural context. They have music camp uh, just to have special class to educate the, the language, the dialect. And the result, I, I, for me, is so gratifying. This is not only that it's satisfying myself, but I think it's also to um, uh, educate um, the, the young performers how to appreciate different cultures. And this is very special. Neat. James, I want to, mm -hmm. I want to follow up in this regard with you. Mm -hmm. When your music is being performed okay. and you hear it, you are there, and the audience offers polite applause after it's over. <laughs> How yeah. devastating is that to you? Yeah, um, you know, you, ideally you want people to be engaged and engaged could mean they don't like it mm -hmm. or that they do like it, but at least they have an opinion and it's mm -hmm. reached them. And yes, they're polite, uh, that was interesting or that was nice or congratulations, sure. Um, but you know, you can't, you learn over the years not to take it too personally because people sometimes take time to digest yeah. it. So <laughs> reading an audience is very tricky. Uh, you can't take it too seriously, otherwise you just like go home and forget it and become, you know, uh, change professions. But do I understand you properly? You'd rather they hated it than just yeah. it had no impact at all? Yeah, actually I would. I Interesting. Would. Probably most artists would, at least, you know, at least you got to them. <laughs> Not that I want to make people hate my music, it's far from it. I, I'd rather they like it, but at least they would have a reaction to it. You want that strong reaction, one yeah. way or the other. 
I definitely really agree that it's you can't take an audience's first reaction necessarily mm -hmm. and it becomes a real skill in kind of being able to uh, understand what is going on for audiences I thought for example I once did a show in a high school and, uh, and Where? in it was in rural California okay and um, the the local the students at the local GSA gay straight Alliance had written to me and begged me to come out to their high school and after a long negotiation with the principal I came and did a show that the classes that came, that were dead silent the entire show and I literally thought I was going to be mobbed as I left I was like okay I've never had an audience this quiet and at the end there was kind of like you know the polite applause and then we did a QA. and a it was dead silence again and after a minute somebody asked a question and then they all exploded <laughs> with questions conversation comments and the teacher said she had never seen them that animated that engaged i asked them questions back they'd understood all these intricate layers in the work and were eager to discuss but they just hadn't felt like they could react around their peers until they knew that it was going to be acceptable to react Isn't about that some topics that weren't so quite difficult. once you broke the log jam boom yeah Yep, absolutely. And and I really remember now when I'm in a show and the audience is, is reacting in a way slightly differently, I remember that experience and go, okay, I don't know what's going on for them yet. Wait and see, um, and, and it will unfold. Mm -hmm. Let me get some sense from all of you about performing within the boundaries of the province of Ontario versus other places that you've performed around the world. And maybe you could compare and contrast um, how how it is to be an artist here compared to what you hear from your friends or colleagues or contemporaries elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You want to start us off here? What's it, what's it yeah, like yeah. here versus outside here? Well, I've done a lot of touring internationally, um, mostly to places like New Zealand and Australia and Mexico. So, uh, and I have a lot of colleagues, a lot of collaborators, and that's why I make those connections in Japan as well. We did a premiere in um, uh, Yokohama so yeah, audiences are, are a little bit different. Um, I know the the um, the appetite for performing arts is a little bit different as well. But I'm also always working within um, an indigenous lens, mm -hmm. so that is similar. So in for example in Aotearoa, which is New Zealand, um, the Maori are very strong. Uh, they're they're in terms of their visibility and the sharing of this, the power and the sharing of their story uh, stories. It's uh, evident when you go out into just the community and you in society, you'll see uh, the influence of Maori, which is different. Here is a little uh, also because our country is quite a bit different. It's a small island. Um, what, uh, many nations within uh, Maori general nation and here we have uh, over 500 nations across a large uh, community mm -hmm. so very similar to Australia in a way um, so I think it's um, I think in those contexts very similar um, to New Zealand and Australia and um, working in places like Mexico uh, which also has a large indigenous population, but it's not yet out as, it's just becoming, um, you know, people are just starting to recognize that as um, uh, something to be aware of and, hmm. and celebrate. Miriam, when you perform elsewhere in the world, what do artists tell you about how appreciated they are versus how appreciated or not you feel in Ontario? Well, um, I feel like in many ways we're pretty lucky in Ontario and in Canada um, because friends of mine who live in the States, um, they're, they seem to be surprised by the different granting opportunities and the different granting agencies we can apply to to get funding. Um, so I've noticed that, and I do feel pretty lucky because um, I have been able to do a lot of my work thanks to the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council, Toronto Arts Council. All three of them have been pretty supportive. Um, They've given you grants so yeah, that you can... so that I can compose, so I can create, do. put on concerts, record CDs. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been really great. Um, I don't know if I have many contacts in Europe, um, so I can't really speak to that. But I did, I remember once um, there was a project I was in called Constantinople with the Griffin Trio um, and Patricia O'Callaghan, and we wanted to try to do it in Egypt. Um, and we went to Egypt and to do a little... Uh, investigation and research and a little snippet from it 
And um, when we were there, I remember them saying, oh, we would love to have it, and you can do it in the Opera House, and it would be wonderful, but you guys have to pay for everything. We have no money. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, a, it's a very expensive project, and it, it didn't end up happening, but it was just interesting oh. to see that side of it. Yeah, we've got a few minutes left here. Yeah. Let me get a couple of comments here. Ala, Alice, uh, tell us, you just came back from uh, Taiwan, right? Right. <laughs> so being an artist in Taiwan versus here, what's the difference? Oh, um, yeah, I, I actually has uh, some premiere um, at the uh, Taipei National Concert Hall just two days ago. Oh, really? Okay. And um, I, I think in, in Taipei, um, their uh, attitude of the musicians, they are very dedicated. And, and, and I think the discipline I observe uh, is a, even... Is, uh, in the old school way, they, they admire the conductor, they admire the, uh, the composer, they are very um, serious. And one thing which I think is a luxury, there's not much union restriction there. Rehearsal just go hours to, you know, to make, make the work, you know, uh, to perfect the work. And um, on the other hand, I, I know in, in Taipei, they actually has pretty good government funding to support their um, arts program, the musicians, and, and educations, all, all these things. And a lot of emphasis on the, uh, let's say, Chinese music. Huh, okay. And, um, let yeah. me just, yeah, let me, sure. while we have time here, J yeah. James being a composer here yeah. versus elsewhere. You know, uh, uh, when I was younger, I had some pieces played in, uh, in Holland, and I thought it was a land of milk and honey because there was great funding, the audiences were really tuned in, they really knew their new music, uh, way better mm. than the ones here at home. And I thought, I have to move to this place. And um, then I came back to Canada and I realized after a while, you know, I have a lot more freedom here because anything I write or have performed uh, in a place which has a history, people will criticize it and look at it through the angle of history. Here, they, that kind of history with classical music does not exist. So carte blanche, you can, you can write as you feel and it's a, you know, a lot less claustrophobic. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, let's finish up. Oh, just a, a sure. big game changer too in Canada is a public health system. So, for example, in the U.S., when I was uh, living there, I had a very serious injury, and there is no public health system there whatsoever. And different places have different levels. So How'd that you pay becomes for your treatment? that become well. I actually eventually had to go back to Australia. Oh, okay. So that becomes imagine if you're already on a very precarious and low income, mm -hmm. then what do you do if you get sick or injured? And I would like to add to that then that we can be very proud of a public health system here but imagine also mm -hmm. if we had a universal basic income mm -hmm. because it's actually not just artists who are precariously underpaid for example I'm making a body of work about climate change at the moment and workers who are going to be increasingly displaced because we need to wean ourselves off fossil fuels imagine if we had a universal basic income along with health care etc that means that we actually look after everyone Sonny you sound and, like you're running for office well <laughs> if you look at the figures it's actually surprisingly doable for us okay. to do it, and we could be very proud of that. I got a minute left here. Uh, Santi, tell me about this, because I know uh, all of you won $25,000, but also as part of this, your protégés, or your, you know, in some respects, I guess, your younger versions of yourself, uh, also won $5,000 a piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell, given where you are in your career, and given where mm -hmm. the other person is, the younger version of you is, what advice would you give them about being an artist in this country at this time? Well, Cody Berry is my protege, and he is ex starting uh, his own company. So I would say to a lot of young artists is that there might be a lot of stumbling blocks in the way, but that it's persistence to continue on um, and move and navigate through as is to continually move forward and not let it stop you. And also to stay strong in your identity and who you are, who you are and what you want and what you envision. Persistence and stay strong. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Good. Good advice. Thank you. Congratulations to everybody on your awards, and we're so glad you could spare some time for us here at TVO tonight. Best of luck to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.